do for the most part now and um, excited to one more time be doing a really wonderful program for the community, for the students, for the staff and bringing sustainability solutions. Somebody uh, from another place um, expressing those kind of solutions. And um, do you want to say anything about the school gardens program? I'll just say briefly. Yeah. Um, one of the programs that sometimes a lot of people don't necessarily uh, connect with us, um, but we're a partner with the Orflo Foundation and have installed gardens into elementary schools throughout the county. So you can keep an eye out on that one um, through the Orflo Foundation and through our website um, called School Gardens. And we have gardens now in 29 elementary schools. We're adding six more this next year. Um, so we're hitting students from CARP all the way up through Lompoc and Orcutt um, and Guadalupe with uh, food producing gardens. So it's a, a nice addition to our program. Mm. So first we wanted to um, thank our co-sponsors tonight. The Center for Sustainability is the host for this program, but we have some very special um, sponsors. And Santa Barbara Permaculture Network is a co-sponsor, and Coil Springs, and they're both responsible for bringing Julius Pitty to the U.S. and to California, along with Global Resource Alliance. And Julius earlier was teaching at Quail Springs at an, uh, a permaculture design course specifically for international development and aid and enterprise, I think they, is the way they covered that. But also wanted to mention specifically Global Resource Alliance is here with us tonight as a co-sponsor, Lynn and Tara. It's an NGO based in uh, Ojai, California doing so much good work and a lot of what you'll see tonight will be about their work in Tanzania. Also, for the first time, Antioch University is a co-sponsor and they have a new environmental studies program with a specific component on sustainable aid. Is that correct? Or, or uh, not yet. We're not yet. <laughs> but it's pretty exciting and so they were happy to be a co-sponsor with this event. We've all been weaving together these worlds for a very, very long time, and the Santa Barbara Permaculture Network brought Jeff Lawton to Santa Barbara in 2006 for an, in, we called it Sustainable Aid for the 21st Century, Sustain, and Permaculture for the 21st Century. And we had just been through Katrina the year before, and we knew that there had to be a better way to do aid. And so from that, we went on to, uh, we, we just had Katrina and, uh, in New Orleans, and in attendance was Lynn and Tara from Global Resource Alliance, and they were new to permaculture. It was a first for them, and that is where most of this got started, where all these links began to happen, this world that we start to weave together. Later, um, we encouraged them to go to the IPCs, the International Permaculture Convergences, in Africa, and that's where they met Julius Pitti, who you will see his work tonight. And he went on and did this work in um, Musoma, Tanzania, on Lake Victoria for a village of 5,000, mainly women and orphans. This is a very special moment for me because we did meet Julius in 2007 at an international permaculture convergence in Brazil. We had a lot of time together. We traveled on a boat up the Amazon. Uh, the boat trip was supposed to take 12 hours. It took 36 hours. <laughs> and it was a rickety boat and it, um, uh, we spent a lot of times without cell phones, without laptops, and lots of time to talk. That's the first time we met Julius and we learned about his work. But it really was not until we went to the International in Malawi, which uh, in Brazil, um, Julius was there with nine other delegates from Africa to make a bid for the next IPC. And they won our hearts with their enthusiasm and, um, and the part that I mentioned frequently is that they, they sang uh, during the, almost the entire convergence and they won our hearts and they won the bid for the next international. And the, um, but now, of course, we have a chance to host him in our own country and we're so happy to have him be here. And um, in, in doing this, or just this last week of having Julius here, um, I had a memory that I had met a former SBC student at uh, the college two years ago. Her name is Patience Nakube, and she is also from Zimbabwe. 
So we arranged for a meeting, and we spent one whole afternoon where they talked back and forth, back and forth, and we talked about this wonderful idea of this interchange of ideas and cultures and how much these countries have to offer us and how sometimes infrequently, for instance, uh, patients said, I think that there are only, she's only the second student from Zimbabwe. But we asked her tonight to formally introduce Julius, and so we asked patients to come up now to introduce Julius. Thank you. Good evening, how are you? Um, as Margie said, I'm, I'm patients, I'm an alumni of SBCC, and I recently just graduated from Antioch University. And thank you. Before introducing Julius, I'd like to tell a little story. Um, because Zimbabweans, I'm sure Julius will tell you, we grow, we grow up on stories. Um, during my experiences here at SBCC and even at Antioch University, I had amazing professors and amazing mentors. And these mentors helped me shape my goals and also be confident in the things that I wanted to achieve and things that I wanted to do and my passion for my country. And throughout my experience, it always made me sad. While I appreciated my mentors from the United States, it always saddened me that I didn't have mentors from my own country. Um, you know, with the current situation in my country, it was always, well, you know, isn't there, you know, one person in my country that is doing something that I can look up to? You know what I mean? Someone that I can learn something from, someone who's on the ground in my country to do the same. And so when Margie introduced me to Julius, I thought, well, my prayer has been answered. There is that mentor that, that I've been looking for, right? And so, and this was very important to me because our culture is centered and, and, and grounded on the, the, the notion or the concept of learning from the elders. In fact, that's how our, how our culture is passed down. So it's with great pleasure that um, I introduce Julius Petey, who in my estimation is a great mentor, someone that I can look up to, someone that I can work with and um, a great elder. I introduce Julius Pitti. Hello. <laughs> so I'm going to start with uh, just a small song so that you get my voice. Huh? So would you join me somehow? So we are going to start by saying, Hiya, 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 Hiya. So you, you, you continue like that, then I do the other part, huh? Okay? <laughs> One, two, three. Hiya, Hiya, Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, 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 Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, 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 Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, Pemaya Kanaka, Hiya, 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 Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Um, as uh, Patience and the previous speaker has already uh, introduced me, I'm honored to be in front of you and uh, to present uh, our story about the, the projects that we are doing on sustainable agriculture uh, in Eastern Africa. Uh, so, uh, myself, I'm both the, the resident of, uh, this is what, Harare, Mozambique. So, I'm coming from here, Zimbabwe here. That's where I'm coming from. And Tanzania, that's where Lini and Tara are. Uh, have also invited us to go and work with them, so within here, Africa. And I'm somewhere here, right now. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So just to narrow up a little bit of Zimbabwe, this is Zimbabwe going like that. So we are somewhere here. This is where we are with the border with Mozambique here and the other part is South Africa, Botswana the other side. So we, the, we actually enjoy that part of uh, uh, the world and my life uh, actually grew up here. Actually, I grew up here and a lot of my family members, they are still here. Either they are Mozambicans or Zimbabweans. So I, I live on both. There is no boundary for me here. <laughs> so uh, just a little bit about myself. And my kind of life history was not very simple. Uh, it also had a lot of conflicts. But at the same time, the conflicts were also transformed into peace. So that was a big part, piece of uh, part of my life. And I grew up with my loving father. So my father was actually teaching me to go into the bush on that side of Mozambique. And we would go and um, look uh, hunt animals. And we would move like we would know where to get what. And then we could communicate with the environment. So I could run without shoes in areas that, were you, that you can expect that there are thorns and these stumps of grass that are bent and I'm running and no thorn is piercing on my feet and I'm, I'm just hunting. So uh, through that experience, my father uh, gave me also, he was loving a lot of animal, uh, rearing chickens and other domestic animals. Also, that included some lots of trees, sugarcane and other trees. He also taught me uh, the medicinal uh, kind of plants in the bush. So if we were sick, we would pick those and actually use them. Um, and now, what happened was that I traveled to Zimbabwe after a certain big conflict between Renamo and Ferimo, so I had to go to Zimbabwe. So when I was in Zimbabwe, now my story begins. Uh, right in Chikukwa, it happens that uh, we were just sitting, being in that community, and one of the most important resources, uh, water, was very scarce, and one of this spring dried out. And we tried to put up all our knowledge and say, wow, the spring has dried, so let's go and put some rocks there so that we try to block when it is running, uh, the water is coming like raining, it won't wash away, and so on. Our idea was if we put some rocks around the spring, we protect the, uh, where the water is coming from, then we will be able to save uh, the spring and we get our water. So we call ourselves the whole community, and our chief told us, ah, wow, we are supposed to do um, uh, rain or uh, water rituals where they brew beer from these uh, cereals, uh, grains, and then they will take their, the elders will sit down around and clap hands, and after that, they will drink that beer. Then all those same ceremonies we did. Then what happens was the next rain squeaked out the whole rocks and everything, and the water was not there again. And you can imagine. So we had to think. Fortunately, there were some friends uh, around us. There was this old permaculture training center called Fambi Zanai Training Center, which is actually found there in Harare. And those are the early uh, kind of uh, uh, positive uh, uh, vibration by Bill Morrison when he trained one of the participants called John Wilson. Uh, they started this uh, uh, permaculture training center. And they were a friend of ours in Chikukwa. Then they said, wow, I think you can, let's see what can happen. And out of this, uh, uh, trainings slowly uh, where we learned how to 
uh, bind the rocks so that when the water is coming, it can actually go on top of the rock and leave the rock there. And at least every step, you have some water right here. And then you can actually boost the water table generated from the rains. And also we used a lot of vetiver to actually uh, plant across the gully, gully and at the same time plant lots of indigenous trees and contours that harvested uh, a lot of water on a watershed or on a big catchment area. And after having done that, another rain came, then there was a little bit trickle of some water. And years come and come again, and we find out that, wow, the water is back again. So it was a happy story uh, for us. So quickly, just to introduce you, these uh, very important people that we work with, is uh, there is another guy called Elias Mlambo. This Elias Mlambo, we actually, uh, we went together to Tanzania to work at the uh, uh, Global Resource Alliance uh, on Kines village. He's a very experienced uh, 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 man. Also, there are two other friends, German friends of mine called Eli and Uli. These were my teachers before. The other one was teaching me science that was the wife, and the husband was teaching me mathematics. So we grew up together and we were sharing, and uh, they are also very uh, good uh, kind of reading of patterns that is in them as part of uh, permaculture. Also, I don't forget uh, the rest of the community and the farmers themselves, where they could actually have a certain feature that interpret permaculture uh, like, for example, medicinal use, for example, they would come and have a gathering and start teaching each other. That made the program uh, to move because then we were starting from the known to the unknown. And it was actually uh, the community themselves teaching each other. So that was very, very powerful. Without forgetting uh, our chief uh, called Daniel Zeushe Chikukwa. Well, he passed away, but... He had uh, a very, very strong beliefs in uh, uh, his traditional uh, beliefs and at the same time saving the natural resources and sacred forests that were part of permaculture. And there were also other women, very important women like uh, Mbuya Pat. This woman, some of these women, just to mention one of them, she's a traditional healer and she knows all these herbs traditional herbs that can treat and help children and also free a lot of people from malnutrition. So all this knowledge was tying up and adding value uh, on the project that I am going to talk about uh, today. So uh, I would like uh, to start uh, showing uh, one small video though. That will help us to get into the project, then I'll get on with the slides. Thank you. We're on a journey in Zimbabwe to visit a place in the mountains in the east where shorter people live. My brother, Terry, and I have been invited to this mountainous region where the extraordinary set of projects has been operating for 20 years. A toilet. Oh, a toilet. Hunger, it's okay. malnutrition, and poor it's health fun. are everyday facts in most of Africa. About half the children in most African countries are stunted in their growth. Zimbabwe has been no exception. Colonial governments destroyed traditional agricultural strategies and replaced them with methods that did not suit African conditions, resulting in frequent hunger and sickness. Most development and aid projects have helped little. The CELOC project for sustainable land use is one of the most successful projects in Africa. It's been going now for 20 years and has totally transformed the lives of the 7,000 people who live in the six Chikukwa clan villages. The 
key to the project's success is the use of permaculture ideas. Permaculture is sustainable agriculture and the sustainable design of human settlements. Its key ethical principles are care of the earth and care of other people. Whereas most aid projects try to relieve poverty by helping people to make a cash income, this project's primary focus is to help people to produce more food for their own households. Another reason this project has succeeded is because it's organised from the bottom up in a grassroots way. Because of this, their project has been about health, conflict resolution and social improvement, not just about food. What we are seeing here is a conflict resolution workshop. <laughs> Sam and Phineas, skilled members of the Senate Conflict Transformation Team, are acting out the roles of the farmers in the conflict. The family at the top of this hillside is diverting water to their neighbours below. That water is causing a big gully in the middle of the neighbouring family's best maize field. They in turn divert water to their neighbours further down the hill. Those neighbours don't mind and they don't want anyone to know. They're doing very well using a rich silk. Does it stop? <laughs> I can uh, go ahead with my speaking whilst you are using the CD. Uh, can I, is it possible I go back to the slides? Right. Right, uh, in, after having uh, been uh, doing some projects with Chikukwa, we see that there are some uh, uh, strategies that we were using to make the project really uh, uh, run. Uh, so I just want to show you one picture that shows how Chikukwa looked like uh, before. And today it's like this one. Uh, if I come back here, I think you can see, although they were trying to leave some kind of patches here, like that, it, it tells you that there, there is no uh, knowledge about even... Uh, vetiver, contours, and so on. This completely show you, this is quite steep slope going up like that. And if it is raining here, the water is going down and actually eroding everything. But if you watch, if you watch uh, carefully here, uh, you see that these are the contours that actually hold the water. And you also see some different kind of trees being planted. Even you see these kind of homes are surrounded with uh, some kind of thick forest. And even this one home, you see lots of uh, plants around. Here is kind of dry, dry land cropping for cereals. But you also can see that uh, they put uh, now the contours. Now if you're coming to Chukukwa, you recognize it by these very nice mountains. And uh, I would like to uh, 
show you these are the member of uh, the Chikukwa uh, communities who are also partly working with the center and at the same time they are residentials. So by so doing we are, are building the capacity of the community. They are the ones who administer at the same time they are the residentials. So they know what is going on uh, on all levels and they also gain some skills. And this is part of the office at SELACT where if you would go there you'll be received here. And you see these are the seedlings and so on. Uh, and this is uh, one picture that shows the community uh, kind of houses. And this one, if you are entering the center from the lower side, this is what you see. Uh, these houses, uh, where, where is it? These houses, well, am I pointing out? These houses, they are here, actually. You can't see them here because you are actually entering on this. So, and water is actually flowing there, and this water is also used for uh, irrigation to uh, grow some food stuff for Chikukwa. And uh, when we had uh, a lot of famine around 2008 or something like that, seven, whatever, a lot of people from Harare were coming there to get food. And uh, then because there were no a lot of things in shops, they will bring those things that we need and will exchange with food. So it was like a, uh, like a, a small uh, uh, paradise. And here you see in the kitchen, uh, these women are from the village. Now they are preparing food for the training courses and they also get employment. It's something different for a uh, rural woman in our area. So, and this is our kind of conference room. Uh, we use the grass just to search, and then underneath here, big space where you can actually hold. One of these, we held a conference, permaculture conference of 500 people here uh, at the center. And guess how we uh, housed them? We were actually using the houses of the community members to house the people. And then they were also getting this fee. Uh, like, yeah. So by so doing, the whole community is actually getting all that uh, resources and get shared. And these are the uh, dining rooms where we uh, sit and, and eat. Uh, yeah, and this is how we cook as well on the fire. Uh, you can see we have got some uh, talented men and women uh, who are teachers as well because one of the important uh, factors in the sustainability we have to create the leaders so that every time um, we can step up on whatever uh, we are learning and this is Phineas Shikoshana is a very good conflict transformer and he speaks quite very well and this is how we would sit we will sit around like that and then talk. Uh, you see these women are singing and expressing their happiness on the project and they express it in different ways, singing and dancing. Uh, this is a typical uh, design for, for sitting place at the center where outside you can sit and have your shed under the, yeah, and you can have this good smell of rosemary around and other flowers around you. So it's kind of uh, uh, beautiful. And uh, this one is um, one of our board members. It's called, he's called Mr. Mandega. He has got um, kind of high qualification in education and he's recognized in the uh, government sector. Uh, he's a headmaster at the moment. And this is the son of the chief, the chief Chikukwa who died. Uh, but this is the son and we work together with him very well. And this is the headmaster of uh, Chikukwa Primary School, and he's also a board member uh, for SELACT. And this one is a, uh, she's a very important woman, the one that plays the background. Uh, she's uh, Mrs. Stolle, and she's the administrator. And she has been there and, yeah, uh, balancing everything together with us. And she is my science teacher called Ellie Joseph Westerman. 
uh, actually she she is a German, but she has been living with us for almost 30 years in Zimbabwe. So she has got a home here in the village, and we all uh, are together. And this is the nursery uh, with the kind of plants in there. And then here, when we get here, we see these are the corn or yeah, one maize open pollinated kind of seeds that we actually uh, put together so that we can actually plant and grow. And, then, and these are the harvests. So they are drying up the, the harvest. And you see the nursery as well. And all these purple trees, different kinds of uh, products that we actually uh, have uh, in Chikukwa. And here, this is one of the ceremonies that I was talking about. It, will be, it was one of those uh, ceremonies in the night. And these are the uh, clay pots with beer and so on as part of the system and the community where you celebrate, talk and with the royal families and so on. And at the center, we've got uh, the young children kind of play center where the young children are also uh, learning there and we hope that as they do that, they also get to learn permaculture through seeing the environmental kind of, you know, the environment changes somebody. So uh, we have quite a stream passing through that center. And you see this woman having a, a child on her back. This child, the mother died when she was giving birth. Because they were living on the other side of Mozambique. And the permaculture center uh, adopted this child and uh, this mother is working at the center, but also having the bed on. So the community was accepting that the permaculture center can actually look after that kid. If you meet this kid, it's, it's like him like that. And he's just running and it makes us happy. And this is Ellie Westerman as well. She's standing on one of the paths at the center. So if you come there, you go over this path over there, there is the big shed here, and the other side here, there is the office and so on. And this is the ZD, uh, the, one of the royal family kind of uh, young men who are also very active in the uh, projects in, in Chikukwa. Uh, maybe as we are just talking, one would wonder and say, wow. What are the strategies that you use to come up with that kind of project? Then it really come up to a point to us very clearly that the three circle of knowledge. So the three circle of knowledge uh, tells us that there is this knowledge in three circle, one, two, three, but we need to act here more, you see, so that you don't exclude the other uh, circle of knowledge. Once you are able to act here more, then that means you, you act consciously and also tap on your subconscious. So, however, we will see that you are able now to turn those... Uh, uh, destructive relationship into constructive relationship. By so doing, we can transform uh, our communities. So the three circles of knowledge, actually the first one is uh, that I would like to talk about is indigenous knowledge. And the second one is spiritual knowledge. The third one is the analytical knowledge. So, however, on this uh, uh, three circle of knowledge, uh, let me start with the, the, the indigenous knowledge. Every community has got its own indigenous knowledge. Uh, that is the culture that changed over time. And that culture 
plays a lot of role in transforming a certain community, entering a phase of establishing a project. So, however, if we are in a community, we will tap those that knowledge within that community and use it uh, uh, for us to uh, be able to work. For example, let me give an example of uh, indigenous knowledge in our own context. It would be like the old elders would leave a big forest somewhere and they say, if you get in there, you can be hunted. And every year, they'll brew this beer and bring it in the forest and they will leave everything, even including chickens uh, that are prepared, this relish and so on, that you would expect dogs to eat. And they leave it in the forest and tomorrow morning they come back again and they open doors and they start eating. And no dog gets in there and eat. And every people, every person would not go there and cut any tree. So they will respect that one. So if you would like to promote some forest, you will work with those elders because they understand the value of, of, of the forest. Then you can start from the forest that is existing and plant more trees and you go, and there will be, you can uh, use them as teachers to make things go. So that's one example of uh, 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 spiritual knowledge. Uh, uh, indigenous knowledge. Then the, uh, the spiritual knowledge now is about the, the God in oneself, or the, the uh, God in oneself. That means, uh, giving an example of this mother, this mother is she actually left some meat in her home and she went to work outside there. And when she came back, the meat was gone. Uh, and she wanted to prepare some good meal for the husband who had gone for work as well. And then this woman was saying to this child, Why did you eat this meat? And without and so on. But in her heart, she knows that it's not right because she never left enough food for this child to eat. But still, she shouts at her because she knows that they, she wanted to give it to the husband. So the spiritual knowledge there is that in yourself, you know what is right before anybody tells whoever. Even a child knows what is right. But sometimes you go against what you think is okay because of the environment. But then we are supposed to use our spiritual knowledge. If we use that spiritual knowledge, most of the things that we would do will work very well because our spiritual knowledge is the wisdom within us. So in, our, in one person or in, end, in each and every person, we have got what we call inner warrior, that is you can prevent yourself from diseases and whatever and all that, fighting eh? for the positive. And then we have got inner wisdom, the inner teacher, and all that. Because the inner teacher will tell you now, well, you meet somebody and you know something, and uh, you don't just let that person do that. You, you teach him in the nice, nice way from your own uh, uh, spiritual knowledge. And you will see that when you teach that person, you want to be arrogant, it will flow nicely because you are using your uh, spiritual uh, knowledge. Then the analytical uh, knowledge, it is that knowledge that we get from school. Uh, giving an example of, um, uh, of uh, for example, this uh, stage. You can actually uh, analyze the conflict, for example, you on, on a pre-conflict stage one, it means that you are two groups or two people with different goals. Already once you are on that stage, you must know that you are almost to get into conflict because you have got two different goals. Once you are able to analyze that, then it gives you a chance to reduce those conflicts and see the best way to intervene. And then this confrontation that's when you get up to, if you don't treat it somewhere here, 
you will find yourself uh, like this other person is saying, I want to go there, I want to go there. Then you are, con- you are on a confrontation stage whereby somebody is expressing his goal and the other one is also expressing on goal and you start confrontation there. But it could have been better if you do it here because then you reduce a lot of uh, conflicts and, and ro- losses that could frictions and so on. Then on crisis, uh, this is the peak where even violence can really happen. And, uh, well, you know, violence can even break lots of things and all that. So we wouldn't like to, to let the conflict up to this stage. Because then, then coming up to the outcome or results of the... Uh, so usually the outcome of conflicts either is positive or negative. So those are two things that happen. But very importantly, on post-conflict, you must remember that you have, uh, you must remember this uh, stage four, because if this conflict was not uh, resolved positively, that means after post-conflict, that conflict is going to, re- to come back again and come back again, and you always, uh, wow, wow, and nothing happens, you see. So by so doing, you would have uh, analyzed the uh, conflict. And then another two would be, uh, conflict mapping. So like here, you put your key here. This one means very bad connection. So if there is a bad connection here and there, then you know you need somebody else to go and come in and make things move because you don't need to uh, go there. When you know already that there is weak link, so something has to be done. Yeah. So... And there is what we call uh, the ingredients of conflicts. This ingredients of conflicts is very important to know that because sometimes you are in a conflict and you think you want to, to make things move, but then you are fueling the ingredients, you are fueling the creation of that conflict because you didn't realize that this is the ingredient. Then it makes everything that you want to do to be like, I don't know why it does not work, and so on. So it's very important, like needs. Uh, Just giving an example for someone who has got 10 children in our culture, for example, and somebody else is a young man who who is not married, and we are going to work together. So I can actually say, ah, let's go for beer after payday. Hey, let's go for beer and really enjoy our money and so on. And this other guy will be very angry because he's supporting uh, 11 people. And his money is not enough for, for going to for beer or whatever. He'll be very angry. But then if you don't understand why that, this guy is uh, angry, you will think that he doesn't like you. Yet it's, uh, the, the needs are very different. So different needs, different people, that can be really uh, an ingredient. Then coming to this one called perception. Uh, The perception, the way you see things is not necessarily wrong. You can see some things, it's right for you, and it's right for the other person. So we create our own world where we are, and there is... No, but like, for example, if I would draw an M, if you go to the different angles, I think the slide will come. And you will see over there. Sorry. Uh-huh. You, you will see that uh, the... Sorry. You will see that this small M, if you draw it, it will... If you stand to the other side, you'll see it like W, and the other side, you'll see it like 3 and the other side will say, oh, maybe it's E or something like that. But whoever is on the side you are standing influences the way you see uh, things. So if you are able to appreciate someone's perception and also try to stand on his own side, then you can create peace in a better way because then you are able to understand your surrounding and what really uh, influences you.
So there are many, many uh, ingredients of uh, conflicts, including uh, religious differences, and uh, there are a lot of those. But once we are aware of those, that will help us to enter into a community and start projects. Uh, right, I just want to show a little bit of uh, the work that we are doing since I was uh, uh, on permaculture here. Uh, this is one example. I want to take an example of a place that I know. Uh, this is the Tanzania project. When we started, uh, when Lynn and Tara asked us to go and work with the Tanzanian community, you see that this place would have also equal vegetation like here. But here is almost inside the lake of Victoria. This is the lake. And not much more impact from animal and people can get into the water. So the water was actually saving the plants here. So you, you, you see it's like almost like a football pitch. And remember this tree so that you will see the next slides as we go. Eh? All right, I just want to come up here. You see there are some houses here and the flow of the water goes down like that. And down here is the lake and here is the field somehow. And you can see all of these forces of uh, erosion and hoof action by people and so on. And it's raining, but still you can see these bare spots. And some, maybe it's a bicycle going around here and see stagnant water. A lot of mass of water is coming from up here and it's harvested. And if it is raining, it will be like a big river. <laughs> so, you see, just the, as I was showing you, that point is somewhere here, and this is where the water was passing. So after making the swell here, you harvest this water. It looks like a river. I will show you later how this swell was shaped uh, to make harvest this water. And remember this tree, huh? Yeah. So on that, the other, you will see that if you don't put those swells, you, you, your field will be like, will be like, like this. If you do some farming a little bit and next year again the soil is being taken, that indicates that all the top soil is gone and it will be, when it is raining, it will be like this. See, when you see dead water like that, it means all the wealth is going. You should be very sad because all the light soil with nutrients is actually going and is creating a lot of famine for the family. Uh, I'm just diverting a little bit, coming to Zimbabwe. This one is a slide where a big seed company was giving cotton seed to some small-scale farm to cover their field with cotton. And what usually happens is that when we, we went there with this friend of ours who works at a forest, uh, a small center that does uh, research in permaculture. So we went it's quite far from where we are and we went there because they wrote some letters and said, come here, this and that. Then we saw that their cotton was with a lot of bugs eating the, yeah. And this guy has got some experience in growing organic cotton. So that's why we call him to go with him there. Now, can you imagine this cotton, for example, it doesn't do well for that year. That means this family is not going to have anything to eat. It's a disaster. But if it was permaculture designed, they would have different kind of crops. And if one crop would not do well because of other reasons, then probably they will remain with something. So, and also, if, it, if suppose the cotton was doing very well, and the big company will decide to uh, pay very little, for example, there are no other people who can buy that cotton. So that remained... That gives the, the farmer now to have some uh, uh, constraints. So permaculture is the best. Now I come back again to Tanzania. I'm coming back to Tanzania here. So we had to use a part of the strategy, three sec of knowledge, and some community development skills to 
bring these people together, let them draw their own land and show the future that they thought will be the best for them, which they think they will be able to manage. And our job was to facilitate, to make them understand their land better. But what is important is that we were not supposed to come in with the skills of permaculture and tell them what to do. Because then if they would face a problem on that small piece of land, then they will refer that problem to us. Then it's no good. Because then we are going to Zimbabwe and they got this problem, they can't solve it. So we had to go in a such a way that uh, they feel it's them who put that. So that at the end of the day, if there is a problem, actually it's the problem that is normal to them and they should be able to solve it because it's theirs. Something like that. So it took us a while because they were always uh, referring us as specialists and so on. So we had really to work very hard so that we are on the same level and then they uh, took off the project. And look now, this guy was able to make what we call A-frame. An A-frame is an instrument that you can measure uh, or places of same heights with a symbol, kind of symbol sticks. And uh, you can still see the leg and all this manure being placed here and so on. Now also, what is very important is to bring all the people together, especially the influential people of the community. In every community, there are different characters that compose the community. If I would like to go to the animal family, uh, I would say, in any community has got a dog that barks. In any community, there is a lion that roar and make people fear. In any community, there are chameleons that change color. In any community, there are snakes who bite on your ankle. So we had to find those uh, characters in a very quick... So we were doing what we call a team teaching. I was with this guy called Elias Mlamb. So we had to investigate and get those people and find their roles. Because if, if, if you don't influence the, the lion, that means the people, after you have trained them, the lion will say, don't take that one, just leave it. And they won't take it. And if you don't identify the dog, the dog is going to talk too much about what you are doing. It tends to get into your shoe and talk like. So make sure that you, you feed the dog with the right information so that you use that dog to spread the good word. Something like that. So, and also for the chameleon, if once you identify the chameleon, then that means, wow, this guy, you must give him the, the ownership of the project because then if he changes color, he changes with the project. So it's him, it's not me. So that way you go along, a long way. So to sort out the people, we had to identify these people using different words in order for us to identify them because if we would call them with the names that I've already told you, then it will warn the community and then they'll behave differently. In our African communities, the people has got uh, a very, very uh, uh, sophisticated uh, kind of psychology that you cannot imagine. As soon as you arrive, they know what ways to tell you to make you happy. <laughs> so if you do not know that, then you are not able to peel these onion layers to get to the heart. Once you don't get to the heart, then you did not do anything. It, the project will run when you are there, and when you are not there, it won't. So, uh, just coming back to the swell here, you see, still in Tanzania, you see this tree, and uh, now the swell is here. It's actually uh, blocking, harvesting the water from this other side coming there, and the people are themselves are doing it, and here is the swell. And you see, after one of these days, they dug this one. It's not yet really complete, but then the, the rains were coming. And the next day they saw, wow, we have harvested the water. If there was no this swell, all this water was going to go down. 
Okay, now they are measuring another one here, and they are also making this. And this is Brandon, uh, another development worker who was interested to learn with us, and he was working. Now, after that, the garden slowly took shape. See, this is the tree. <laughs> and the water was coming from this other side, coming down here. Look at the beds with beans, mulch, and all that. These are the kind of the processes. And in one time, the garden, if you come go there, it's like this. You'll be surprised. And there are some trees like that. And you see me walking there, I was completely surprised and said, wow. And I'm picking all these passions, you see, these ones. And the same place? Yeah, that's the same place. And these are the uh, uh, kind of, uh, what we call these ones, they are the... Yeah, and, and then these are the bananas and a lot of uh, leguminous plants. and it's, it's like a food forest. Yeah. And, yeah, we went there for 11 months, but in between we were jumping, about two years or something like that. But um, no, not more than two years, not more than two years. And this is the, if I had shown you very well, you would see that there is a windmill right on the lake. Now if you take your picture down there, you can't see the lake, you see? You can't see the lake. You can't see the lake at all. Now, just on the other side, you see this windmill. And that water that I talked about is coming from somewhere here. So when it hits two of the swells up here, we saw that usually the water will overflow because there is, sometimes it's raining too heavily. So we had to lead this water into the lake, but with the slowed motion making this uh, pit beds, pit beds. And then we were planting some banana on this other side. I look at, this is after, you see? These are the holes, eh? yeah. Going down to the, to the lake, maybe this is the windmill somehow. And these are the plants there. So by so doing, when it is raining, all these grasses will actually clean the water and leave the fertile soil in the holes here. And we can scoop that all of your soil into the field and use it. Mm. So this is a f uh, fish pond. Since we saw that there was too much water going down to this lake, we actually had to dig a fish pond in, in the middle of the field so that we can actually direct some of this water into here and actually rear some fish, for example. So we can actually start lots of projects with permaculture design on the same environment. And all this element connected they support each other and form a, a sustainable community. Now this is the uh, fish pond, and now it's like that. And it, I'm grateful because uh, Lynn and Tara, they are here. They know this place. And, and uh, if you would want to visit this place, you will, wow, and see the people. Mm. So, if you look carefully, that land was quite bare on the first slide, you remember? A lot of birds from that area, they were coming here. And you, if you are there in the morning, something like that. It's really like here. Yeah, then you say, wow. I mean, if we can do that, why not the rest of the world? Um, it will be quite a happy community. <laughs> And now we have got the chickens. Just by the fish pond, we have got the chickens uh, there and the ducks in the fish pond as well and the dogs right in there. So that because lots of other wild animals, they wanted to come on this forest. So if we would not have dogs, then other predators will eat the chickens. So we would uh, keep the dogs, the chickens together and they are... So this is another plot because after the first plot... We call the lakeside. Uh, the Lin and Tara actually called us for another bigger four hectare kind of plot. So I just want to, this slide is there just to give you an emphasis of how we can do, possibly do water harvesting. Here instead of uh, cutting these trees, they were the existing ones, we just dig a small hole around the, and leave the trees there because their roots will have an effect right down on the ground 
and make some space for water. If we have a lot of water here, it will go down following the roots. And then here we form a microclimate. Then we can plant things like uh, greener depressions and other climbers here. And it becomes like a kind of a, a forest. But then after each rain, the next few days, then we were harvesting water like this. So if there was no this kind of scheme, then this water was not going to be harvested. And we know that it's part of uh, the big share of wealth creation. Uh, water is an issue. Mm. So I'm just jumping to uh, Chimani Man. Chimani Man, that is down there in Zimbabwe. We also do some research projects that we do with the different communities. And we have some district competitions where school children are also involved and parents uh, to celebrate uh, the innovative farmers. And we go there and they watch. And we also invite the government officials and all that, those people. And these school children were actually singing for uh, the environment. And this is part of the guys, the old guys who were sitting. Can you see these bananas? Mm -hmm. No one is eating them because they are planted which is a good story. Mm. Why are they eating them? There are a lot of them. I think they've eaten and they can't finish them. <laughs> nearly everybody, near, nearly everyone got something like this. Nearly every, everyone got something like this on his hand. And you could not finish it. I had to carry them to the car and <laughs> go and kill the celebration. <laughs> so it's, it's a sign of uh, plenty from the permaculture. Field. You will see that there is a lot of corn uh, planted in that because this farmer is uh, beginning to transform uh, his field into permaculture field. So these are the swirls that he was uh, harvesting water and is growing. The land is very steep slope though. And a lot of people are amazingly um, looking at uh, his banana plants integrated in his big uh, field and Next year, they'll go back again and see uh, the developments. And, and these are the people moving. Right. Here I'm at a porridge site where down here there is a, actually a site that was created to start spreading uh, permaculture message on the low rainfall area of Chimaniman. That is about 150 kilometers from where Select Center is. And at Select Center, the rainfall uh, average is about 1,500 mils per year. And here it's about uh, 300, that is maximum. And it's quite dry. So the idea was to start uh, drilling projects on extreme uh, dry and see how it goes. And now down here we have got some chickens, we have got some different kind of herbs that we got. This is comfrey. Uh, comfrey, we use it as a, a green manure, liquid manure. If you cut these leaves here, uh, within a week you'll have new leaves again. And you put them in a bucket of water. Within four or five days, it's completely like green liquid. And you just put it on your field. And you are improving the fertility. At the same time, these leaves, if you give them to chickens, then the yolk of the egg becomes, yeah, quite delicious. And at the same time, it, uh, to us at our home, it treats coccidiosis. That is another disease that found in chickens. So the more you give them the uh, comfrey, the better. And we also actually, uh, you can actually use the leaves to treat, uh, if you have got some shallow wounds, it can heal so easily. But don't use it for deep wounds because then it heals on top and then it will, yeah. You can actually make tea and drink it why? Because the tea can also uh, neutralize some kind of acids in your stomach 
And if you have got some signs of ulcers, it can actually instantly heal as you drink the tea. So, and it's very easy to grow this uh, comfrey. So, uh, it spreads a uh, nice plant. And uh, this one, uh, I would talk about this one because I like it. Uh, it's called wormwood. It's very bitter. But as it, as, as it is very bitter, uh, it treats and uh, yeah, take off a lot of other pathogens in your stomach and in your body as you adopt to enjoy the tea now and again. It actually treats you. At times, it makes you resistant to malaria. Because then the mosquito doesn't want that kind of... Yeah. Uh, and this one is called... Uh, no, this one, this one, this one. I would like this one first. <laughs> Why? Because I saw it in, uh, in here, in Santa Barbara. Ah, I saw it in Ojai. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a small joke. <laughs> because if you are still new in America, you will always say Ojai. <laughs> so this one, for me, if I take the leaves and put them on a hot water and uh, uh, wait for about yeah, two minutes or something, then the tea becomes like a green, greenish smelling sweet. And then I drink this tea. Then I can feel my board is being cleansed. Uh, if, if you know, go for uh, passing your urine, you feel that it's so easy. It's really, it makes your, yeah. This one is good for me. And this one is called, um, uh, uh, it should be rosemary or not a lavender because they are kind of similar. But this must be rosemary. Rosemary is very uh, good for us to, to also to have tea. Because the tea of rosemary, actually what it does, it uh, when you drink this tea, it comes into you and it neutralizes the blood cholesterol in your body. And it makes the, it lower your blood pressure that way. And you feel fresh. And it's quite good. It's very good. It's very good. And it's, it's very easy to, to plant. You plant, it grows. You have nice flowers. You can sometimes take a branch, put it on your... Yeah, put it on your around the house. It's, it's got a very nice smell and all of that. So those are very nice plants. And here I have got this uh, very um, kind of challenging. Have you ever heard about Amarula beer? Have you ever heard about that? Yeah, this is Amarula plant. So in at our home, it just they just they are like indigenous. So. Uh, we have got a goat crow, so the goat takes the seeds and swallow them. So on the, so you cannot, they cannot digest the the seed. So when we take the manure and put it in the field, so they grow, and then we will take the seedlings and put them on pots, and then later on transplant them into the bush again. So we create the Amarula jungle food forest. Yeah. So. The, the, this is my friend Wemwood. I like this plant. But I want to show you that there are these citrus fruits. Can you see them? Yeah, these ones. On the same pot, we plant these uh, citrus seeds. And as they grow, we can then actually transplant them into another pot. And later on, we can graft them to any type of citrus that we want. Because then, if we grow lemons, they can be used as root stock. Uh, because they are very drought resistant, so they can grow anywhere very vigorously. And then later on, you can put uh, other uh, Washington novels or whatever. And by so doing, you are creating diversity and high quality uh, uh, fruits. Yeah, this one is one friend of mine as well called Yarrow. The Yarrow is very easy to grow, uh, you can actually grow it uh, wherever you want. Uh, this one, uh, I sometimes use it as tea, and it helps me so much to get myself relaxed and, 
yeah, I don't know what it does in my board. If I mix that and just drink it, and it, it, it makes me feel okay. <laughs> so here we have got a small uh, play center for the school just down here at Porret as well. And we have got these kids. Uh, they are put together by the parents because from where we are to the next school, it's about five kilometers. So if you have got a young kid that you want to go to the play center, it means you have to go there every morning and come back. So that means if you take your child down there, you spend the whole day with the child walking and you won't be able to get time to do other things. So the parents decided, wow, let us in the rotation take two mothers, look after the children and the others are going to work and at the same time teaching them. So... Uh, it's, 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 it's working very well. And down here, this is right at the garden, and these children are seated, and uh, this is uh, one of our house, and this is the background of the garden. And right inside the garden, we see all these kind of fruit. Uh, this is a mango, eh? and yeah, you are just under the tree, and you are taking a picture like that. So if I would be there with you, this is what you would see uh, being created there. Yeah. Right, if you are entering the gate, uh, this is what you will also see. Uh, you will just go like that. The house is over there, down there. So you will actually have a look and see that one. Right, I want to go back a little bit here. Right. Uh, I want to tell you a story why this one uh, evolved to become the Porret Trust. Because as I told you that uh, my wife and I wanted to stay there on a very dry land. Then, and I was still doing some work with Selak here, there, and we had planted a lot of these trees that you have seen plants. Then our neighbors would want those plants as well so that their home would be like ours. So every time I come during the weekend, then a lot of people come, like class start. Every time, every time. So one of these days, it happened that uh, after the community has benefited from all those plants, because we were just giving those people who are interested, just to let them take seedlings and go and uh, plant. It happens that the, the government environmental management uh, kind of agents have heard about this project and they came there and put it on the competition, national competition. And this project won number one national prize. <laughs> now, that was in 2006 and we were not expecting to start the trust but then the minister, when he was talking there, there were a lot of cars in the bush there, hanging around there. I was surprised why these guys, they put a big tent and whatever. These guys with the big cameras and, and so on. And the minister said, these are the projects that we would like to carry forward and we wish the community are going to work towards registering a trust that will make it possible to be a non-profit organization in order to spread the vibes and the ideas from here. And on the project tour, I was taking him around. Uh, unfortunately, I did not bring some photo to share, but I am telling you the story. Then that, that was the birth of, uh, of Porrid. And up to now, if you will be there and walk around, you will see that other homes are starting to transform themselves. I like that as well with some kind of uh, water harvesting schemes and all this and that, elements of permaculture. So I only wanted to go back to that slide because then it could explain everything. Um, on this one, this is the background of Chikukwa uh, project on the eastern highlands in Chimaniman. And this is Olivia uh, Mazoyo, uh, the daughter of one of my friends that we were working together. Actually, we married at the same time. I think my daughter and 
his daughter, they're almost the same age. And this is the background of his garden. If you get there, wow, it's a, it's a good garden. It's a good garden. Mm. And I've just forgotten to tell you that they won the district prize just recently when I was coming. And the whole district came there to really ululate and celebrate with them. And whoever was there had something to learn from there. Yeah, that was very nice. Um, just to, to come back again to Chikuka there and now, there are also a few problems that are happening. You see this kind of, uh, this can show you that. But however, there is a lot of awareness there that can be also shared to uh, the rest of the world, uh, just like today. Uh, we can't deny it. There is no community without problems. But what we need to do is to live with the problems and find opportunity in those problems and go forward, like Chikukwa. Mm. <laughs> Uh, just to summarize just a little bit there, uh, I think um, vetiva is one of those uh, uh, plants that I would do, fall in love. Because vetiva, we use it for uh, reclaim as pioneer plants. Where the land is very degraded, you can plant vetiva there. It will only want one heat of rain, just pam, once, and then the vetiva grows. And once the vetiver grow, it actually creates foliage that is much needed for grazing. And once vetiver is planted on the ground, equally the leaves, equally the roots going down. So it really... And when the cows are just grazing like that, they just cut the leaves and it can actually reshoot again. At the same time, if you have got a slope like, and you want this to stop or to reduce landslides, you plant a lot of vetiva here, then in most cases you are assured that the soil will remain firm. So we did some experiments where we planted vetiva and then we dig going down like that. You will see that even down there the roots will be still there, just like the leaves. Also, uh, it is a repellent itself, vetiva itself. We can use it for making mats, to use the leaves to weave some kind of mats. And you can actually use the leaves to thatch houses. So it's kind of um, like an economic kind of plant that can actually give business. So other people who are much more clever, they can actually make uh, vetiva essential oil that can be used for, yeah, if you use it, yes? Vetiva, V E T I V E R. Actually, I was lucky to meet Vetiva here, and I was smiling. And as I was talking with my one of my friends, West, I said, "How? Oh, look at this Vetiva. I don't have a clear picture of Vetiva, but the Vetiva is outside here. When you are coming from the 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 ground there, turning up here." Exactly. So, yeah, I have to take a picture and then I want to show the Chikuka people that hello, I met Mr. Vetiver there. <laughs> it was quite exciting to see Vetiver. Uh -huh. So we saw that um, we use lots of swells. Uh, swells, those are kind of like ditches that blocks um, measured lines that are, um, the soil is measured on this line of same height so that you actually harvest the water so that it doesn't take a momentum but it just gets stagnant and sink the water. Uh, garlic reclamation is part of the whole game but it's much better when you do garlic reclamation in relation with growing food. Then it do not become like too much load. Um, forests are very important. They can actually heal the land very fast. So every time, let's think about conserving forests that we have. 
and then maybe think about planting more. Because the more we can save the forests that are existing, the better we speed up with the, the current problems that we have. Uh, and at the same time, what is very important is the training, exchanging of skills. We have to always find our way to learn more and more, at the same time sharing our experience to make meaning for the world. Because each one of us has been having some experience for a reason. The main reason is not for you only. The main reason is to share with your next generation or the other community. So we are actually uh, communicating uh, vessels for the good of the world. So we should talk and talk just like my original name and share and also learn to listen as well. It was very important. Otherwise, you talk and talk and then you are not listening. Then it's dangerous. Mm. And um, just as well to summarize you again, for Porret, it is an organization which is situated on a very bad kind of land like Quarry Spring, comparison to Zimbabwe. And we would like permaculture to go forward, and there are a lot of people there. And it would be nice to have many, many people uh, use the permaculture technology for dry land cropping. And with special efforts to women who are in the community, because they are the most powerful uh, people and they are the mother of, of the world. Also, in support, we need clean water. Uh, as we do whatever we do, conscious, uh, providing clean water, because dead water brings a lot of disease to our families, and that really uh, paralyzes our community successes because sick people don't think well. I mean, uh, so we need to have lots of home designs where we design in a permacultural way so that each element is interconnected to serve so many other functions to support the community and the greater community for education and also for food production and for environmental purposes as well. Uh, there are some things that don't seem like permaculture projects, like, for example, football uh, playing, for example. If you, as an entry point, if you buy these two, three football, whatever, the balls, and then give them to the young children, you will see them playing the football every Sunday or every afternoon. And from there you can start a, 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 a kind of club to grow some things. And you can go that way. It could be an entry point. Or you can start a saving scheme for the women who will lend each other money. And at the end of the day, they will find their way that all the money they are talking about is about the land and the soil. And then later on, you drive them into group gardens and they grow food to save the money. And food, clean food, and health children at the end of the day. Uh, we are very aware that there are a lot of diseases like HIV and AIDS, and by growing clean and uh, health food through permaculture approaches, that's when we can actually make a difference together. And more importantly, by sharing skills, so that those people who cannot grow because they don't have skills, we actually share with them and train the young generation to be able to be self-sustained. Uh, the other very major uh, challenging issue and very interesting is the grazing management. Um, vast catchment areas are covered by grasslands that are pop um, overgrazed because of uh, uh, unmanaged well uh, cattle impact on the rangeland. And from my friend, uh, American friend called Alan Salvary, if you have a chance to get that book somehow, you read it, it will take you somewhere. So he was my teacher for one year. So he has got a, a, a enormous kind of studies that he drew uh, from Zimbabwe. He was flying on the air and he was walking with his horse with a, someone called Star Jamson and Cecil Rhodes long back when they come to Zimbabwe. And 
All these were called rivers. Today, you only see the signpost river, and there is no water there. And he told me that animal impact is the best of regenerating the, 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 also the rangelands. And he taught us how to do animal impact, and we are still in Chikuko also having a model. And he's doing this one in Matetse, in Tebeleland, somewhere in Victoria Falls. He has got a good demonstration. Uh, and it's, the springs that were not giving water, now the water is there. It's a, an amazing uh, a story that uh, I feel I need to share. Uh, without forgetting another guy, the farmer that farmed uh, water only, he's called Zafania Maseko uh, Piri. He's coming from Zishawan. Uh, Zishawan is another next town from Tare, our town. And this old man has amazing kind of design that also inspired the people from Chikukwa. Uh, I used to take about 70 people with big bars and get to him, and then he'll do his work. When you bring people back home, you just see them doing some things. So uh, there are projects like mushrooms and other income generating projects that can be done by, by people in the communities and that can also make a difference and give a bit of money and freedom to women. And uh, at the same time, once the women has got a bit of uh, some income, then they support more the children to go to school and give those things that they need more. Uh, what can be also very interesting is the internet library and books so that the communities are are accessible to information as well, so that at least they can learn some things and something like that. And of course, we need to build some community-based resource centers so that uh, we can share with the rest of the world and we know where to store that information and create environmental, good environmental uh, kind of for people to start and share knowledge. Uh, shall I say thank you? Uh, uh, there are these two films that we were supposed to show, but I'm not quite sure on uh, what time and whatever, if you are still interested. And then we would like to create a little bit of time to, for discussion, if you, if you would feel like. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that would be the best. You know. Try this on Marathon, because then the it's also on the flash drive. We are afraid maybe the flash drive will not. Oh, the two-minute one. I'll try. Try one of. Yeah, try one of these. Huh? This one? Yeah. Uh -huh. In Tanzania, we don't have dictator. We don't have war. We have only poverty. When you come and walk around, you can see the manuscript. It tells you the story. And that story is sometimes reason. Being poor is unhappy for our bodies and our plants. We, we destroy our own trees. But we have no any different alternative on how to get the fight. Well, it is giving more than a million days. You know, we teach you that. The water which they have just facing don't satisfy them to hold it from it. The agriculture here is not feeding everybody. And because it's not feeding everybody, it makes people wonder whether they need a lot of external support or not. The government is giving a lot of bags of money, creating dependent syndrome. And sometimes they think they are useless themselves. This is the way my friends and I are trying to change the way 
poor people pray. We have to stand up and do something. Let's uh, teach people how to fish rather than give them a fish. We are at the center of Africa. If things so will change, starting from here, everything will change. We are starting a movement of simple solutions. We solve the community problems by using the nature. Just teaching them how can they solve the problem themselves. We have been doing what we call permaculture. The better you feed the earth, the better the production comes. The healthier the people become as well. A small amount of land can produce a chunk of food. We learn so much of these things, and they are just adding to the soil of nutrition. Wow. Water bone diseases will no longer be in this area. We'll be using clean water and safe water. It can be very well excited. These hookers are helping with these people. This region can be a test case for all poor countries of the world. Can we transform a village? Can we transform a region? Can we make life cheaper, easier, healthier, and greener for the poor people of the world? Yeah, maybe for a few minutes. So we thought we might just open it up for questions. We have mics on either end, so if you raise your hand, we can walk around and pass mics out. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to come all the way to the USA to share your experiences. I, it's not very often that people from here get to where you are, and probably even more rare for people from where you are to get here. So thank you very much. It's a long journey, because I've been there. I, I know Zimbabwe. It's a wonderful, wonderful country, but a lot of struggle, though. I know that for, from having spent time there. But I have a question about, uh, I'm glad to see you mention the livestock because I know livestock are always an issue, grazing issues in, in Africa have always been a major challenge for when you're trying to save the soil. But the one thing I was wondering about is I see you planting a lot of maize, but I didn't see sorghum or any of the other more traditional crops that were replaced when the Europeans came in. And from what I understand, the nutritional value of the, the earlier diet that was consumed by Africans before the Europeans was much more healthy. And for some reason, much of that has not been brought back. And I'm wondering if that's been discussed at all in your community, because apparently the, the diet was much more rich in vitamins and nutritional value as compared to the, you know, the main, mainly I know people eat a lot of maize, being kind of the staple crop. So. Yeah. Uh... Actually, in our project in Chikukwa, we do what we call uh, some s uh, food fairs. And we promote this uh, traditional culture food stuff in order for people to actually appreciate. In Chikukwa, there are kind of varieties of food stuff now that we also serve at our center. And people appreciate it because uh, some of these uh, food stuff, they are drought resistant in terms of of if it is not raining well and so on. But definitely, as you say, a lot of people tend not to like to plant those. And we still find a lot of uh, resistance in the other parts of the districts or villages. But we hope that through events like the competitions, the uh, fairs, food fairs, and also good preparation of those food stuff. Well, sometimes if you don't prepare something very well, then you tend to feel it's not good. So we are also having some uh, courses where we share our cooking skills with different people. By so doing, we see how nice something uh, can be. Definitely, that's our goal, that we should actually grow 
those uh, plants or crops that would give us diverse uh, kind of uh, nutrition that we need for the children and for the home. And apparently there are our elders there who are actually getting something like 100 and something years old. If you ask them what they eat, if you go and look at what they eat, they eat the traditional food. And all of us who are growing now and we want to eat this new food stuff, maybe if you are 40 years, then you are very old. Uh, so, yeah, your question is valid. It could be a question or a, a, a comment that also support us so that we also learn from uh, you guys. Uh, uh -huh. Can okay. you describe the seed fairs that you do every year and how they came about? Uh, the seed fair came about when we were doing some permaculture competition on field tours. And then because of uh, the skills that are in the community, the community themselves decided to make some events to show uh, the diversity that they have as a way of being proud about what they know very well from their own community. Then it evolved, and I remember in Select, we, we actually do two or so per year, where we bring all these uh, people with rich knowledge to display their skills and we invite a lot of people and they come there and they taste the food and then the judge will look at the food stuff and the price is won to top 10 and it becomes an eye-opener and educational event. Mm. Okay. Okay. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Actually, it's the animal that is the most interesting. Uh, usually at home, a chameleon, when it perches on a tree, it mimics the, the color of that host or wherever it is. And if it changes to another tree, it also changes again. So the moment you get into the community, you must know those people who might want to be like you for a moment. And if they meet another person who wants to use this poisonous to kill whatever, you start doing that as well, and, and so on. So that person without focus, someone who is like blown by wind. Yeah, so if you want to make a project that you need to breed leadership, and you, you use your time to train that kind of a person. So most of the resources are lost. Because then this guy is going to change again. And so you really have to, one of our most important assets is the human resource. And we need to weave that carefully so that we, have, we bring about the realization of our community sustainability and succession as we breed the leaders generation after generation. Choose where lakes would go or yeah, that's a good question. Because then it clarifies the community.
community trainings and uh, uh, because what we do is that when we actually the approach was this land was a training ground or a training example that was used to transfer knowledge or to breed or to encourage knowledge from the people so that they see that they can do it. So it was like 36 family comes together on this plot and we were working with them for some months so that they get the skill. And then after, so they are the ones who were actually citing and do all this and dig and tell the reason why they should put it here because they can see the water coming there and so on. And the main idea behind was to start with this core group and once they understand the approach themselves, they will transform their homes. And now, if you go to Tanzania, you will see those uh, kind of spearheading homes that are becoming a permanent uh, training examples as well. So that is the teaching uh, strategy where you encourage the farmers to teach each other. Okay. Uh -huh. Hello. Oh, wait a second. Thank you. Um, I thank you so much for being here. It's really inspiring. And I was just, um, we had heard. Um, over time about the uh, financial situation in Zimbabwe and how hyperinflation has made things very difficult for your country. So I was just wondering, since probably a lot of the work that you've been talking about happened during this time of financial instability with your currency, and we don't know what's going to happen in our country, but I think it would be interesting if you could just make some correlation or connection how were you able to accomplish all of these things, certainly at the grassroots level, and but also you're talking about government officials too. I mean, it seems like the, the spread of society with the background of hyperinflation and currency instability. Thank you. Yeah, that one is a valid uh, question and most important. That's where we can realize the impact of permaculture. We have been, we started in uh, 1991. And you can see up to 2000 and something here when we had this hyper inflation and uh, freezing of dollar. Uh, the people had already gathered these skills of permaculture. So in the region of Chimani Mani, people were actually coming from town to get food from us. So it was actually very powerful and still very powerful. So uh, for me, I don't know which ways to explain. It really worked so much, and the community itself could see that they are powerful than those guys who are maybe having big cars, big business those days. Because then they had something to eat and something to offer to other communities. So it was very, uh, it was a very good uh, model. So permaculture actually worked worked very much for Chikupa during that. Okay. Are you having gardens at schools and teaching children to grow food and maybe do composting too? Because I think that's something that we should be doing too, is teaching kids in primary school how to grow their food and then eat it at the school lunch. Yeah, uh, I think there is a program also being done by somebody called Walter Nika and uh, a program called the Rescope. If you would Google that, you'll get very wonderful um, uh, work being done, but uh, we are not doing as much as what Riscope is doing. We are changing the homes and the families, but uh, we also have some influence on some schools. Uh, like at Porred down here, we have got four schools that brought their whole children to come and collect plants, and they were planting in their yards. And uh, we hope to increase that pace. And we are working too much with the many, many schools on peace building project. 
that uh, involves the teachers, the different political parties, uh, the people themselves. Because we believe at the moment we work with their subconscious and consciousness mind and their heart, then quickly they find peace in themselves and they will find a place to adopt some permaculture uh, strategies and transform the, the whole district now uh, from Chikukwa. That is 180 uh, kind of villages expanding from one village, uh, one word called Chikukwa to, to 180 words. So it's coming up quite wide, but of course there are challenges there and there, but it's very interesting. Uh-huh. Hello. Um, I'm curious about the specific um, hold on, a break. Um, the conflict res resolution. Like I really like the idea of the three circles, but right before the video ended and they were having the example of the two men speaking, just kind of more on an individual level, how if you could maybe give some specifics of how the farmers come up with their solutions? I'm curious about that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the video was not able to play. If it had played, you could have actually see how yeah. uh, it works down here. Um, like, for an example, on indigenous knowledge, the chief there, Chief Chikukwa, has got some advisors with him. Suppose there is a problem or a conflict around Usually every Sunday you go, those with problems, they, we have got what we call community court. And then they use their own indigenous knowledge to settle those. And usually you are given fine, you are asked to pay fine or something. Yeah. And uh, the norms of the community is known by everybody that if you do this, it's wrong, this is sacred forest and all this. So what we had to do was to combine the indigenous knowledge and the analytical knowledge that we start from Fambizanai Training Center and other schools. And then say, wow, you see this forest that we are looking after, it's not only about rain making and uh, uh, sacred uh, kind of uh, uh, whatever, beer and so on. It's really actually like a dam where all this rainwater comes all the water will be captured in. And then we would take a bucket, for example, a 20 liter here, 20 liter here. We go to the forest and pour it and measure the distance. And we go somewhere where there is no organic matters and we pour. We will see that the distance will be longer and here sometimes it don't even travel. It goes down. That way then we will go into the fields and say, if we don't want this topsoil to go, what do you think we should do? Then we start to in, uh, incorporate mulching, whatever, integrated of different plants that gives nutritious and all that. We go in there. Then on a uh, spiritual, we are actually doing what we call, uh, we have actually a club that does meditation. And uh, others, of course, they go to church. Some other, they go to they do the traditional uh, kind of believing system, but the whole concept is about finding God in oneself. There is no God who is coming from there coming to you. The God is coming from you out. So the moment you know what you are doing is wrong and you are doing it, then uh, you are missing it. So, so all the teachings together, we also make sure that we don't... Uh, allow the difference of uh, religion being an ingredient to conflict. We make sure that that should not play a part. Okay. Ah. I have a question. When you showed your village, the distant hill was clear cut. So the first part of my question is, what was going on there with that, that forest that was eliminated? And then secondly, what do you guys do for for fuel production, for cooking? Because I know a lot of trees get cut down for charcoal production, and how is that part of your formula? Uh, for the, maybe I start from the charcoal. Yeah, it's still uh, a challenge. But 
of course, we, I omitted some lots of uh, slides that I could have shown. Lots of, like in Tanzania, they are planting thousands of trees, and you could see all the school children planting a lot of trees as an awareness program. And of course, they have started having awareness of the solar cooker, but not many people really adopted that very fast, because then the test of the of the food also is. But uh, those are first stage of awareness. You can imagine if you would teach 100 people in community development uh, in projects, if you get seven of them doing well, then you have done it. Because it's so difficult. Because the, the farmers, they've got lots of risks. And the risk that they carry is their real life. So every time they try new things, they do it with fears and also fear of unknown because then there is part of their life. So I don't know whether I have uh, answered you on that question. I hope. Okay. Hi. Uh -huh. um, I'd like to thank you for starting off with the song. That was really beautiful. And my question was, if you can let me, us know the meaning of the song and the roots of it. And I would like to know exactly what we're saying. Uh, come again, your question. The song, I'd like to know the meaning okay. of the song. Yeah, the meaning of song is uh, in Shona. That means uh, the permaculture is very good. The permaculture is very good. And then you, you hum by saying, yes, yes, it's very good for us. <laughs> so all of you, you were saying, yes, yes, it's very good. <laughs> then I was saying, the Pema is so good. Then he said, yes, yes, it's very good. <laughs> so the women would sing that song on their own. In a certain event, you hear them singing, and then you say, oh, wow. It's a, an expression of a community solidarity and uh, uh, happiness and uh, confident about the future. Because usually songs, stories, and all that can actually compose your current uh, culture and pave way and a window to look at what is going on. So I'm wondering whether I should take the last question and then we can interact. One more and one there. Okay. Back here. Okay. I'd like to thank you for um, gifting us the knowledge you've given and also the stories. How can, as a college student, as a Santa Barbara citizen, what is the best way for me to reciprocate that, this knowledge? Uh, come on again, how can... What is the best way for me to gift people the knowledge you've gifted us? Okay. Wow. You see, that's why I pretend as if I did not hear what you have said. <laughs> Just to allow myself time to think how I answer that. <laughs> it can best be known by us all uh, how we can do. If we have got uh, the God in ourselves, the inner wisdom. I think we always find ways to make that happening. And one of that way, we have been dreaming of, um, there is this guy called John Seed who knew about what we are doing and is trying to promote kind of a, a more convincing videos that take lots of subjects in detail. And later on, maybe we could weave this program that we can use an international program for Chikukwa, Chimaniman district and invite other Africans, colleagues, new organizations to come in and also tap on that to spread it. So it is one of the reasons why I am also traveling because one day you will see us communicating with you as a college. But as a college, it would be very nice to connect you with our college again in Zimbabwe and maybe like uh, you can see patients here the way how she talk, uh, I feel like I want to take her home as I'm going, because then she's going to do it. <laughs> so if you, your college, you have something to offer to our community, and uh, we can also have something to offer, as you have just rightfully mentioned. So that could be a very uh, good cooperation if we will do, uh, continue paving the way with Maj here and all of us uh, together. We are, I'm so excited to uh, stand here and talk to you in that regard.
Well, I think the evening should have ended with your question, not mine. It was an excellent <laughs> question. Um, I want to say, uh, in answer to your song and your talk, Jambo, Habari, Sana, and Asante, um, I wanted to ask you about dates. When was the permaculture project in Musoma? And the reason I ask that is because I was in Musoma in 2009. I visited a farm on the yeah, in, shore of the in, lake. In, in December. And, um, That's when we started. Uh, the, actually, what, this December? December 2009. Oh, okay. We actually had our ah. Christmas in uh, Kines on that small village. So it gave us much more time to see how the people get relaxed and tap into their indigenous knowledge. That's when it really started. Up, we spilled it off up to February, I think so, January, February, something. Huh? January, February. That's when we came back after three months or so. And then we came back again. So in total, we had three, uh, 11 months going to Msoma, but spaced. So that could be uh, totally about two years if you would count when we make uh, some really big changes. When, hmm. I, was, when I was there um, and visiting a farm in Musoma on the lake, yes. at that point, to irrigate their crops, they were bringing buckets of water up from the lake manually, bucket by bucket. Uh, they and were bringing water yes. from the lake yeah. by bucket yes. into the field. And I see in your presentation that you're gathering water, harvesting water from rain and from the hillsides. Yeah. In the dry season, do these farms that you've set up, your model farm, have they, do they still rely on the lake for water? Yeah, on the farms that we have set, we actually had this windmill. There is a community resource man or people who are able to make the windmill. Ah, so and, and what we did was to tap on what they have and ask this guy to make the windmill for the project. And by so doing, we are telling the community, confirming that you have got the human resource that can be an investment for you. And on the second project, the four hectare, actually this um, um, windmill was so amazing. I think about, is it two kilometers or something? Lynn? Yeah, three point something kilometer, the windmill pumps water like mad. Wow, that was really something to learn. And this one was, wow. Then they could see that the man that they stay with is underused and he can actually do a lot of wonders. And this transformed that big plot. And when GRI used to give actually food to these orphans, now they are getting the food from their uh, land that the community are growing together to support the, the uh, orphans. And automatically, they are actually taking this skill, transferring it home. And the project is expanding. They are actually doing the farmer-to-farmer -farmer, uh, training. It's actually very interesting. And it's quite fast in Musoma because of the seasons. They have got two seasons per year where you can grow some annual crops. And it was, for me, it was a learning point as well. Very exciting. Mm. Thank you. Asante Sama. I just wanted to mention yeah. that Julius uh, said that his community would be so impressed to find out that our community college, one of the top ten in the nation, has a permaculture design course taught here. And so for them to learn that this college and these students, the students here, are doing uh, the permaculture work, it's in a way that also that we can stay connected with his community but how powerful that will be for them to learn that we see permaculture that important that we have a permaculture design course at this college. Mm. That's a very strong comment, yeah. And I hope if I would be able to show the video of this discussion home, it will be part of my reporting back home and people will be encouraged. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably it for questions, so let's give Julius another thank you. Thank you. And thanks you all for coming, and, and keep an eye out for other talks and, and presentations we'll have coming soon, and I'm sure Julius can talk to a few people uh, uh, on your own as you come up. So thanks again for coming this evening.
Wow. Oh, I see that. Got it. Oh, we, we have to be out of the parking lot by 9:30 too, because security goes home and they want everybody out by the lot by 9:30. So, I thank you. Okay. How are you? Good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mom is the best person. Who knows what is right for you? This is good. <laughs> Mm. So, I, I had two questions. Yeah. You know, when was, where, where do all the little plants come from? How did you get those started? Oh, we get them from this new permaculture center from Bizarre from Harare, then we spread the. the okay, so they're uh, constantly working. Mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. And then we multiply them, and also we teach other farmers to start small nursery so that we can spread those useful plants. Mm.